Take an object, like an apple. If we send white light at it, some colors are absorbed, while the others are reflected and reach my eye. Sight is the most obvious imaging technique that we can use, but most of the time it only gives us information about the surface of objects. But what if you wanted to image the inside of an object? Well, for this apple, there's an obvious solution. But this technique is quite invasive and in most cases it's not really an option, especially in the case of medical imaging. So today, in the Lutetian project, we're going to discuss non-destructive volume imaging techniques. You already know one non-invasive volume imaging technique, echography. That's how we get pictures of babies in their mother's womb. It relies on ultrasounds, sounds so high-pitched we can't hear them. Sound is a vibration that travels through a medium, compressing and expanding it. These pressure waves propagate well in water, which happens to be the main component of the human body. When ultrasounds encounter an interface, some of them get reflected and go back to where they were emitted. The duration between emission and reception tells us at what distance the interface is. The stronger the echo, the more different the two media on either side of the interface. Using this information, we can construct an image, but it's not really a conventional picture. Optical images get their contrast directly from the colors that we see, but the contrast in ultrasound images represents how much different materials impede the propagation of sound. Basically, in this image, the waves are blocked in the white areas. Another important difference is that ultrasounds have a much larger wavelength than visible light. This impacts the resolution of images. The smallest details you can get with ultrasounds is about 1 mm in size, while they are about a thousand times smaller with light. So, how do we get volume imaging with finer details? Well, we adapt the principle of echography to the more precise optical waves. It works, but it's much harder. And it can be used to probe fingerprints. To shine a new light on this, we're going to meet Agidius Auxaros, a Lithuanian researcher working at Institut Langevin at TSPCI. So, hi Agidius. As we said you're working on fingerprint imaging, could you tell us a bit why it's interesting as a research topic right now? Right. Obviously, uh, fingerprint imaging is uh, most useful for identification purposes. For example, police can use it for uh, forensics, uh, border control. Currently, it has expanded actually to the areas like um, you know, accessing different facilities like gym or even your smartphone. The technology itself has evolved during years, so it started with just uh, ink-based uh, finger roll. Uh, and now we are using technologies like, like optical coherence tomography. However, the most common fingerprint imaging technique now is optical, which is based on frustrated total internal reflection. When a wave hits the interface between two media, part of it is deflected and the other is reflected. When we shine a laser into a block of plastic, there is an angle above which the whole beam is reflected inside. It's exactly what happens in an optical fiber. Light is entirely reflected at the plastic-air interface. That's why this phenomenon is called total internal reflection. If we put a second block of the same plastic very close to the first one, some of the light gets into it. Even though a thin layer of air still separates the two blocks, light is able to propagate. This is called frustrated total internal reflection. In fact, the wave doesn't just die off on the exact spot where reflection happens. It decays over a very shallow layer of air, only a few wavelengths deep. It's just as if it were peeking outside to see if it wants to propagate. Give it back the medium it came from, and the wave does exactly that. Light jumps through the gap and goes on propagating in the second block. Could you tell us what a classical optical experiment of fingerprint imaging would be? Okay, so maybe first uh, let's take a look at the fingerprint itself. So actually fingerprint is a three-dimensional structure. So if you look closely at your fingerprint, it, it has um, valleys and ridges. And that structure propagates um, in various forms uh, across the whole fingertip. So uh, the best way to see fingerprint uh, is um, just take a, a glass of water. And uh, what you immediately see on the other side of the glass is a fingerprint appearing. That's because ridges that come into contact with the glass, they break total internal reflection. And valleys, they don't. So that's why you see uh, an image. Uh, in a commercial product, uh, uh, the same effect is used, uh, but uh, instead of a glass, a prism is used. So you, you put a finger on a prism, and the same effect uh, generates a fingerprint image. However, uh, total internal reflection is inherently a surface imaging technique. 
That means if you have any defect on surface like dirt or even moisture, it will affect the image quality because it affects uh, total internal reflection. That's why um, we try to image a little bit deeper to be free of surface artifacts. So we image like um, a couple of hundred micrometers below the surface. What technique do you use to get a deeper image? So the technology that we're using is called OCT, or Optical Coherence Tomography. Uh, this is used widely in ophthalmology. And uh, its principles is essentially the same as white light interferometry. When two waves with the same frequency meet, the amplitudes add up, so that some parts get higher and some others get lower. This is called interference. If there is no delay between the two incoming waves, we say that they are in phase. This leads to a wave whose amplitude is twice as high everywhere. Then, if we increase the delay, we get more complicated shapes until we get to a case where they are in opposite phase and cancel out. And then, as the waves are periodic, increasing the delay further will make us circle back through the whole sequence again. That's why it's rather easy to see interferences when we use monochromatic lights, that is, light with only one color. If we look at a laser spot up close, we see dark and bright areas around the brightest spot. This is an example of interference. Now, when we use white light, an example of polychromatic light, a light that contains many colors, things get a bit more complicated. When two beams of white light meet exactly in phase, we get a more intense light, just like before. However, when we increase the delay, it is impossible for all frequencies to meet in phase again. So white light yields interference patterns that are specific to each delay and never repeat themselves. That's why looking at white light interference patterns is a way to measure very really small delays between two waves. This process is called interferometry. An interferometer splits waves in two. One part goes through an object and is delayed with respect to the other part, which acts as a reference. When they meet again, they interfere, and we can deduce the delay from the shape of the pattern. And if you know the delay, you can find a length. Just like here, these colorful figures between the two glass slides are interference patterns. Seeing that allows us to know that they are separated by less than a micron, and a more precise experiment could give us a much better measurement. What kind of interferometer do you use, and what do you measure? Okay, so this is effectively um, a white light interferometry setup here, except that we use a camera rather than a point detector and uh, light emitting diode rather than the laser. And, uh, but the principle is the same. So I, I collimate the source and it goes onto a beam splitter, which splits light in two parts. One goes onto the reference arm and the other on the sample. So the light reflected back is recombined by the same beam splitter and image on a camera. So to demonstrate uh, an imaging principle, we can image a coin, with, which is actually a three-dimensional object. And uh, with OCT, we can select an imaging depth, so we can image different parts of a coin by actually moving reference arm, and this way gating the arriving photons. So, for example, on the left, you see a classical raw image of the coin, and on the right, you'll see OCT images um, being um, acquired at a different depth. So you see a top of a coin being imaged, and then it goes into the middle part, and then eventually to the bottom part of the coin. The interesting feature of this uh, OCT technology is that it can image through, uh, for example, distorting media like a piece of paper. So if we put the paper over the coin, uh, we can see that the raw image is destroyed, or the quality decreased, whereas OCT image is almost um, recovered. So if we add another layer, uh, we can see that the, the raw image is completely distorted, and OCT image still shows some sort of information here. Can you use this technique to image fingerprints? Yes, uh, and for that we use a different system over there. Uh, that we build adopted especially uh, for um, uh, fingerprint imaging because it has to have a, a window against uh, we can press a finger to stabilize it. Um, so we also made it uh, more compact compared to that system over there and mobile so that we can send it to uh, uh, different uh, researchers who work um, in biometrics area to test it. So we can just quickly demonstrate the working principle so you can put the hand uh, like that, and it will image uh, a single fingerprint. So here is a, a surface fingerprint, 
So it's a, a, it's a classical image, and nothing new is here. And now we're going to go and image, uh, acquire a few images below the surface. So it starts stepping in uh, Z direction. And what you saw here is a, an internal fingerprint. Now, internal fingerprint is below the surface, uh, like 500 micrometers. And this is a place from where external fingerprint regrows in case of damage. So it's, it's kind of a master template. And uh, the whole idea being that if external fingerprint is damaged, your internal fingerprint might still be intact. So we use this concept for, let's say, a more secure way of recording fingerprints. What are the main limitations to the depth you can image? The main limitations, uh, as with uh, any optical imaging technique, would be uh, mainly two, and the uh, most obvious is absorption, um, since when you're trying to image deeper, uh, photons have to travel through a, a thick layer of uh, tissue which absorbs light. But ultimately, the imaging depth is limited by photons that uh, get uh, multiply scattered. We've seen that light is deflected when it reaches an interface. That's kind of a simple situation. But sometimes, there isn't just one big interface, but many of them all over the place. And that's the case with fog, which is just a lot of water droplets suspended in the air. In this kind of environment, the deflection of light adds up each time it meets a new interface. As a result, part of the light beam is sent randomly in all directions. We say that it undergoes scattering and becomes diffuse light. In light fog, light is scattered only a few times, and only a small part of it becomes diffuse, so that we can still make out shapes. This is the simple scattering regime. But in heavy fog, light is scattered so many times that it basically all becomes diffuse. This is the multiple scattering regime. In fact, you can sometimes see both regimes at the same time, like in this picture of the Eiffel Tower. The bottom is perfectly clear, because there is no fog there. In the middle is the single scattering regime. You can still see the tower, but it's blurry. Finally, the top is completely blurred out because of multiple scattering. Biological media acts a lot like fog. There's a lot of small structures and interfaces that scatter visible light, so it's hard to image deep into the body using this kind of wave. So in OCT, we try to solve this problem of multiple scattering by interferometric detection. Only those photons will generate OCT signals that travel exactly the same path in sample arm and reference arm. So when imaging the surface, um, most of that signal will be generated by singly scattered light uh, from a sample. However, if you go deeper, you still have to rely on the photons that are singly scattered at that particular plane. However, there is a, a particular depth of tissue now that also scatters light back, um, and that light might get multiply scattered. Now those multiply scattered photons will match in a path length and in time to those singly scattered light. Therefore, they both will generate signal uh, on camera. However, only singly scattered photons carry information, whereas multiply scattered photons will just blur the image because they lose uh, the spatial information because of the scattering. Well, Egidius, it was great having you. I think now we understand a bit better how our city works. Well, uh, thanks for coming. Actually, I have um, a present for you. So this is uh, a fingerprint image recorded 100 micrometers below the surface, where you can see uh, fingerprint pattern together with sweat ducts and this is something that extends from the surface to one or two millimeters below and we can clearly see them uh, at this particular depth. Well, thank you again for the picture and for the interview. Thank you. And that's how a good understanding of the physics of waves and a clever experimental design can lead to very precise fingerprint images. If you like this video and don't want to miss the next ones, feel free to subscribe. And if you have anything to say about this video or its content, you can always leave a comment. Mm -hmm.